Welcome to Cup Chat with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Today, join our Birding with Extension team members as they discuss the Montezuma quail. Hope you enjoy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cup Chat with Birding with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. I am sitting in a parking garage at the Fort Worth Stock Show. Um, for, I'm not cold because the car's on, but it is freezing here. Um, so if I, my video isn't working quite right, uh, I'll turn it off, but I'll be back. And, uh, today we are going to stay in house and, um, I don't have a mug. Uh, I just really do wish I had some of Liz's coffee. I got up early and uh, decided to go ahead and come over to the, uh, barn while there was no moisture falling, uh, to be a little safer. So anyways, uh, Liz is today going to talk a little bit about Montezuma quail. So First off, like, I guess here's my question to Liz, because I know, um, and we've kind of talked about this, she did her graduate work at Sol Ross on Montezuma quail, and we know it's kind of an illustrious bird. Um, and so here's the truth, uh, Liz, I just want to make sure you have seen a Montezuma quail and can attest that they are real before we start today. Uh, yes, they are not a myth. I have... <clears throat> I have seen them. I have actually gotten to touch a Montezuma quail. Um, yes, they are real. They're not like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. They do actually exist. Which okay. I didn't think for the longest time they actually did exist because for the almost the first like six months of my study, I did not see nor did I hear a Montezuma quail. Um, so yeah, even I thought they didn't exist for the longest time. Gotcha. Okay, so... Uh, it looks like we're having some video difficulties. It looks like you are the only one showing up on Facebook, but that's okay. Um, I'm working on it here. Okay, so uh, why don't you kind of give us an introduction um, and let you, I'm going to let you take the reins and I'm going to figure out what's going on with our video. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> I just put together just a real quick slideshow um, just with just a couple of pictures to illustrate with y'all. Um, sort of, I don't know, just to sort of illustrate what I have sort of done. I'm not going to talk too heavily about, um, you know, my study a whole lot. We'll see if this little error message goes away or not. Hmm. That is unfortunate. We'll see what happens here. We are having I can't see anything, so you're good. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just see this the slide, so just go for it. Okay. Well, it's not letting me open the actual slideshow for some reason. So, um, yeah. So first off, <clears throat> what is a Montezuma quail? So first off, fun fact: so there are actually four different quail species um, within Texas. Um, you have um, the northern bobwhite. Um, which is probably the most common quail, um, definitely the most common quail. You have scaled quail um, or blue quail is another name they go by, um, as well as you have um, gambles quail. And uh, for those of you who don't know what a gamble quail is, um, if you have ever seen Bambi, the little quail running around with the, it's technically called a plume, um, the little thing coming out of his, his head, um, that would be not exactly a gambles quail, but that's kind of what a gambles quail would look like. Um, and obviously the fourth is the best, in my opinion, um, Mon the Montezuma quail. So Montezuma quail go by like a stupid number of names. They The two common ones are um, Montezuma quail or Mern's quail, um, but they also go by hog quail, crazy quail, harlequin quail. Um, there was... Um, my husband, one of his students, apparently know them as a speckled belly quail, which I've never heard that one before. Um, but uh, we'll talk about why they get some of their names. Obviously, for harlequin quail, you know that black and white face, as well as the the really pretty spotted chest. Um, clown quail for the fact that they have that really bright orange crest going down the back of their head, and then that bright blue bill. And that bill is like very, very vivid blue. Like when you get it in your hand, they are very vivid blue. They're like probably one of, definitely one of the flashiest quail that we have here um, in Texas. So um, obviously when, um, 
let's, uh, my screen won't let me move on. Oh, oh, are we actually gonna work now? Maybe. Maybe. All I see is white. I know, that's what I see too. But, um, so I'll talk about, we'll see if it loads. Um, so we also have, um, so females with most species of birds, obviously the female is a lot more drab looking um, than the male um, because they're the ones that have to generally sit on the nest. Um, so they still have the same markings um, as the male. Um, oh, what is happening? I think we go back the other way. I mean, it's loading, it's just going slow. Hmm. Yeah. See if you click there. Hmm. I'm not saying my picture cannot be displayed for some reason. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. This is off the top. Um, it decides to work great, if not, oh well. Um, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll just stop sharing my screen. Um, so, female Montezuma quail um, are. Hmm. I'm still saying I'm sharing. Anyway, oh, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> so, female Montezuma quail. Well, and Liz, you're starting to sound a little like an alien. Oh, no. Maureen warned me this might happen. We're just having all sorts of technical difficulties this morning. Gosh, this is a rough one, guys. And maybe the Montezuma quail are coming in and attacking our, our cup chat because they don't want to be found and they don't want Liz to tell you all the tips and tricks to finding them. I know it. Did it get oh. better? I don't know. You're better now. <clears throat> okay. So, so female Montezuma quail, a lot more drab. Um, I wish I could share my screen. Y'all have to go look up a picture of them. Um, but they still have that really bright blue bill, um, like the males. Um, if we look at um, their distribution within Texas, um, probably the best place if you're going to go see one is in um, far west Texas. So like near Fort Davis. Um, we do have them here around not directly around Uvalde, but in the hill country. So if you go to Rock Springs, um, Kickapoo Cavern State Park for birding the border, Kickapoo Cavern State Park would be a good place if you wanna to go to the birds, bats and owls talk. That's a good place to see them um, as well as um, Dobbs Run, which is like just across the road from Kickapoo. Another great place um, to, uh, to see Montezuma quail. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so that's pretty well their stronghold in Texas. But if you really, really, really want to see one, you're going to have to go to Arizona or Mexico is their like strong point where most of their distribution is. Um, but if you don't want to leave the states. Arizona is your best bet. Um, now, just to confirm, you are not saying that we have seen or are going to see Montezuma quail at any of those birding the border locations. Correct. It's just if you are going to see them, those are, that is your best chance of seeing them is right. there. But we have yet to actually, it, it, if it kills me, somebody is going to see a Montezuma quail at some point during one of our birding the borders, like come hell or high water, somebody is going to see one. I'm on a I'm, mission. I'm on a mission. If it takes me 10 years, it takes me 10 years that it will happen at some point. <clears throat> now they were doing some Montezuma quail research out at the Dobbs Run and had heard some, I believe. Hmm. I believe you, you're definitely right. I just can't remember if they just heard them or they actually saw them. I'm not sure. But you said in your research, you would hear them way before you would see them. Oh yes. So, oh, so speaking of, so their call. So if y'all have ever heard a um, canyon wren. The male Montezuma quail sound very much like a canyon wren. It sounds like, um, like you know in the cartoons when a bomb drops it makes it, I can't whistle to save my life. Um, my husband makes fun of me for it all the time, but it's a very like descending whistle. 
Uh, it's very distinct. Once you hear it, you can't like unhear it. I still to this day get like those phantom whistles when I'm in an area where I feel like there's Montezuma quail. You just feel like you're hearing stuff, but it's very, it's a very easy call to pick up on it. And it is distinct from a canyon wren. Um, so they are easy to, to tell apart. Well, and let's talk about a little bit about habitat. So like when you are out um, and when you were doing your graduate studies research, what kind of habitat are we looking for these guys in? Like are open areas, more brush areas where that open meets the brush? Give us kind of your ideas of where we are going to be seeing them. So Montezuma quail are generally found in <clears throat> what are called um, pinion juniper woodlands which what a woodland is, is it's basically somewhere in between a forest, which is very, has very dense trees. And then you have on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a savanna or a plain and a woodland is in between. You have trees, but there is a lot of space in between those trees. Um, so that's where you'll find Montezuma quail. Um, they actually like to hang out in areas um, that have a, uh, that are, that are pretty hilly. Um, you'll find them in the flats, but you'll actually mostly find them on hillsides, um, not very steep hillsides, um, but you will find them hanging out on, on hillsides. Um, so they need, uh, you know, those open areas to forage as well as they need those trees and brush species whenever there's a predator that comes through, um, they'll actually flush towards um, those junipers or that brush for safety. Um, but interesting thing about Montezuma quail in regards to what they eat. So they do eat seeds, um, you know, like Bob White, scaled quail, your typical quail. But the interesting thing about Montezuma quail is they, most of their diet consists of these things called corms or tubers. So it, they actually live underneath the ground, which is another reason why they're called hog quail, because they have to dig for their food. Mm. Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll, sh I'll share all these pictures um, on Facebook so everyone can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, but they got some big old feet on them, like huge feet. Um, their claws are like a half inch long. Like they, they got some talons on them. Um, so they obviously have to dig for their food. And a corm or a tuber is, it's like a starchy part of the plant. So think of it like as like a potato or a carrot. Um, gotcha. <laughs> so they'll dig, um, they'll dig down into the ground um, to dig up those little things. They're normally, I, I could probably, they're, they're not very big, but they're very, very nutritious. Um, there's not a whole lot of diet studies done on Montezuma quail. Again, research in general is fairly lacking in Montezuma quail because they're, they're really hard to catch. Because with scaled quail or bob whites, normally how you can trap them is there's this, this thing called a funnel trap where um, it's this mesh, um, wire mesh like square. And then they basically have these little tunnels that they go in, but then the end of the tunnel is kind of um, tapered in a little bit. So once the quail is like squeezed through, they can't get back out again. It's, you know, right. it's like you as a kid sticking your head through like the railings of um, like the stair railing. It's really easy to get your head in, but then you can't get your head back out again. I don't know yes. if that ever happened to you, but my parents I had to never, I never stuck my head through this stair, stair railing. I can't say I could. I, I, I may or may not have done that once or twice in my childhood. So um, but anyways, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so um, because you can't really trap them Oh, well, so you can use that method, but the way that they get the quail to come in is they bait with seed. So normally like Milo seed. Since Montezuma quail don't generally focus on seeds, they focus on little tubers under the ground. You really can't bait for them. Right. Um, so we had to basically, the best method of catching these quail is actually wandering around in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, um, with bird dogs, and you're trying to find these quail at night while they're roosting. Um, so what a roost is, it's, it's how quail, um, any ground 
ground dwelling birds, so quail, turkey, um, they'll roost, um, or grackles will roost too. Um, but quail don't fly into a tree like a turkey does or like grackles do. Um, they actually have to do it on the ground. So what they'll do is to help conserve heat when it's cold outside, like today, um, they'll sit in a nice little circle um, with their butts facing towards the center of the circle, heads facing out. Um, and that is how they will spend um, their nighttime. Um, and so we were wandering around looking for these groups of quail um, sleeping. And um, when the dogs would stop to or point to indicate that they found them, we would um, shine bright lights on their faces because, you know, that's exactly what you want to have happen to you when you're that's sleeping nice and soundly in the middle of the night um, <clears throat> to, you know, blind them so they couldn't see us. And then we would take um, a dip net and um, use the dip net to uh, hopefully catch more than one Montezuma quail. So. So how many Montezuma quail did you actually see and identify for your... Uh... Graduate so, study. So I can't tell you how many I've seen, but I can tell you we caught 55. Oh, that's not bad. No, that's actually um so I can't I can't speak to how many have been caught now, but I know I think for our study we were up there with one of the most. I'm not gonna say the most, but like maybe the second most caught. Um so yeah. We had, a, we had a pretty good run, but um, yeah, the, the other cool thing about our study is so we actually did what's called backpacking the quail. So in order to find out, part of my study was looking at survival rates as well as um, looking at, you know, where they like to spend their time for habitat. So in order to figure that out, you have to be able to follow them. Right. Um, so we put these little backpacks that, um, and I'll share some pictures on Facebook, um, but these little itty bitty backpacks that we would um, use this like bungee um, string and make like a little, like there's a little loop at the top of the transmitter and we would loop it like around their shoulders and then tie it um, on their back. And they just hang out with this little backpack on. Um, so yeah, so I got to follow quail around for almost four years. So well, that just says <sighs> I am so sorry, everyone. I am exhausted. Um, I only got one hour of sleep yesterday, so um, it was quite oh, a night. Emily. I apologize. Um, well, that just sounds so neat. Like, I mean, I just think that the interesting part about Montezuma quail is how how challenging they are to see. And I think that's one of those things about birding that I can enjoy is that sometimes things, I don't like it. I mean, like, I don't, I'm not a patient person. So not any part of me enjoys the challenging part of birding um, when they're just not right there. But, you know, I think that's when they're rare and you get to see one and it's special versus you get to see one every day. Um, it's something that I like. So I hope we've got lots of people who have uh, on this morning that have said they've seen them in the Davis Mountains by the state park um, and things like that. So maybe we can find one for Rio Diablo birding camp. I'm hoping, like hoping, hoping. And one of the things uh, most people, when they see them on a Zimacoil, they don't realize they've seen it because like, so one of their defense mechanisms is and all quail do this, but it's very strong in a Montezuma quail where a bob white or a scaled quail, their first instinct normally is to flush or like fly away when they're startled. Montezuma quail will just like freeze in place and just sit down. Like they don't go anywhere. And they're, it's hard to believe, but their, their coloration, you look at them and you're like, there is no way one of those quail can hide in the grass. Like I would see it before I ever stepped on it, but they camouflage so well. It's ridiculous. But I mean, like I said, they're, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm drawing a bite this morning. Apparently I need some more coffee. Um, but their, their drive to just sit and not go anywhere is so strong that most time people will almost step on them before they ever flush. 
So they'll flush out from underneath your foot and it scares Emily. I still to this day have like, just thinking about it gets my heart racing because you, you, your soul leaves your body for a split (laughs) second. Like, you're just like, I am going to die. I don't know what this is, but I'm going to die. Um, so the, so a lot of people have probably seen one and don't realize it because it flushes out from underneath their foot. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we'd be walking along and you would just look to your left because you were looking for some birds and you'd look to your left and there'd just be one just sitting, just sitting there. And you're like, okay, like, did not know you were there. They're just, they're, they're the coolest birds ever. They're the coolest quail. I'm sorry. I'm super biased. I feel like we need to have a debate of like, what's the coolest quail in Texas? I feel like. Well, um, okay. So several things. So Miss Connie, love Miss Connie. Ho- hope you're doing well this morning. She says she's adding seeing Montezuma quail to her bucket list. But it's so like one of the cool things to me about Bob White quail is that they will answer, you know, like, and I can't whistle. Oh. So do yes. Montezuma quail answer? Like if they, if you played a call or you could m- make the whistle, do Montezuma quail, would they call back? So that is actually a fantastic question. So that was part of some of the research that I had. One of the methods that we used to trap, not effective, but we did use it. Um, So overall, not really. They're not like a Bob White where you play a call and they're just gonna whistle back at you. Um, During the during the pairing season for Montezuma Quail, which um, is about like May, April, May, um, we would go out to New Mexico and actually play the calls um, to, we would play a, it was not a female call, it was like an assembly call, and you would get those males that had not yet found a, um, a partner for that year, you would hear them whistle and they would actually come in to you, which was the coolest thing ever to have like little quail, like that first picture I showed y'all of that um, Montezuma quail sitting on that brush pile, that picture was actually from a male that we had called in and he hopped up on that brush pile um, to whistle. Um, But no, in short, no, they really don't, they're not reliable. That's where we would get into the debate because I really do enjoy like, I don't know if tricking the Bob White is a great word, but like, I really enjoy it when I'm like, ha ha, I'm not a quail. And you answered me and I really can't whistle. And that's the best part. Cause like, I really can't whistle. And so it's like, I, it's just be- unbelievable that it could even think by any stretch of the imagination, the noise I'm making from my mouth is a Bob White. So maybe just <sighs> lots of them are, are smarter. I guess, I don't know. I don't know if I would say smarter. There are moments where I question because like I said, so they like, their drive to just sit down whenever they're startled they would do it in the middle of the road I had multiple quail you'd be driving in a truck and they just sit down in the road and you're like not the best time for that for that method of predator evasion um but uh yeah I don't know they're just I don't know they're just I think for me it's the like It's the look of them, the fact that it looks like they just slapped on a bunch of like random colorations on them. They're like, here you go, you're gonna have an orange crest and a blue bill and this black and white spotted chest and like this very vibrant black and white face. I think that's super cool. Plus I spent four years studying them. So I'm very biased on that respect. Gotcha. Well, is there any other quail fun facts that you would like to share with us this morning? We are getting close to our eight o'clock time marker. I have to go classify steers this morning. Uh, So we are going to maybe wrap up just a smidge early. Uh, Plus, we are going to remind you to register for Burning the Border. Registration is open. Someone told me that there was a rumor that Burning the Border is not happening. That is false. So please, 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 please do not feed into the rumor Burning the Border is happening. Uh, and it will be super fun. So we need everybody to get registered so we know that you are coming. So Liz, uh, any more quail fun facts? 
Uh, I can't think of any. I feel like I feel like I shared all my fun facts about them. I'm sure I'll think of one. If I do, I'll 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 post it on Facebook. But okay. And you're gonna post all the pictures that we did not get to see because I'm sitting in a parking garage, and that is probably why uh, Zoom is not loving us this morning. Um, but I apologize. But let's just be happy that I safely made it to the parking garage this yes. morning with yes. the roads and the weather. So uh, that's always fun. I hope everyone is staying warm at home. I I can't. I know it's cold in Uvalde, but it's not as cold as it is here. So just saying. No, I won't even try and argue with you on that one. But I bet the crew from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania that is watching uh, is laughing at us right now. Yes, probably. It, I can almost guarantee they probably are. So uh, anyways, Liz, good to catch up on our conversation about quail and listening a little bit more to your research and kind of talking about where those Montezuma quails are for anybody who has that on their bucket list. Miss Connie, um, what do we got next week? Um, we have... Um, Brandon Nooner, our, um, one of our birding guides for Birding the Border next week. So we're going to meet him, um, learn about him and, and his, his life story. And he's going to convince y'all why you need to come on his trips at Birding the Border. Now, and the interesting about, thing about Brandon, and I know this is kind of, I'm going to give a slight preview. Brandon uh, has just moved to the Del Rio area. Um, and is going to be considered a local guide. He's not from Del Rio, but uh, he lives and works on Laughlin Air Force Base, and so we're excited uh, to have him on, and he does have a pretty cool job that we will hopefully dive into a little bit uh, <laughs> tomorrow, well, next week on Cup Chat, but maybe a lot more on another episode. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Liz, great Montezuma uh, talk this morning. Um, I'm going to go classify show steers. Uh, and y'all have a great day. And y'all are like, what is she doing with classifying show steers? No one knows, understands what that means out there. We're basically saying what breed of show steers they are. So it's like IDing birds, but harder. Um, oh. Because we have to look at their ear set and their head shape and if they're pulled. So uh, just fun oh. fact, uh, we, we ID show steers just like we ID birds. So uh, there's your <laughs> agricultural minute for today. Uh, everybody have a great day. Happy Wednesday. And uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Oh, you have to end it. Because I made you host. The three little buttons at the bottom. It's